With July upon us, we've officially entered the second semester of 2019, and in light of that, I figure now is a good time to look at one of the anime world's most notorious students? Sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to make this metaphor track. I, I came up with this whole premise of making a report card for Netflix anime, mostly to set up bad jokes about how they get an F for handing in Carolyn Tuesday late, and they should have checked their work on Ava, but really this is just a review rundown with a silly framing device. Still, with Netflix encroaching more and more on the anime market, and mostly working outside of the traditional seasonal release paradigm, even when they license seasonal anime, I do think it's worth evaluating their individual series as well as what they're doing as a whole. And this video is the start of my attempt to do that, but nowhere near the end of it. While I only had time to write four proper reviews for this video, I really do want to run through their whole 2019 catalog eventually. I'm going to take my time with this, and I make no promises as to when I'll finish it, but if you're watching Netflix anime, you're already used to that, right? Once I do complete this overview, I'm going to try to come to some kind of conclusion about something, but for now, please enjoy these disconnected thoughts about Netflix anime that almost have a unifying theme, but not quite. And look forward to my ones to watch recommendation list for summer 2019, which I'm working very hard on right now. Anyway, to start us off on a high note, Agretzko just came back for a second season, and pretty much everything that I said in my first video about it still applies. The show still offers valuable life lessons for adults presented with cartoonish simplicity that belies a great deal of character depth. Where the first season was largely focused on the immediate challenges of finding one's footing at work and dealing with apparently hostile management and co-workers, this new one has more of an eye toward the future. The season sees Retzko struggling to figure out exactly where she wants her life to lead. Her overbearing mother keeps pushing the idea of arranged marriage on her, and while her suggestions are all duds, they do get Retzko thinking more seriously about finding a real life partner. At the same time, she finds herself exasperated dealing with a new hire at work, a kid fresh out of college who's even less prepared for adulthood than she was in season one, and who takes it out on everyone else around him. Motherhood is a core theme here, and a lot of Retzko's growth involves learning how to support and nurture other people and finding happiness in doing so. There's a lot of potential pitfalls there. A lesser show could easily end up endorsing marriage and babies as the only way a woman can be happy. Thankfully, Agretzko handles those ideas with nuance and makes it crystal clear that while that life is what's best for Retzko, it's not for everyone. A lot of people close to her go down very different paths this season, some of which lead them far away from her, and the show treats all of their decisions as valid, because its core lesson is simple and universal. You can only build toward happiness when you know who you are and what you want. Compromising on that truth, or trying to force others to compromise on theirs, will only bring you and them trouble. That's valuable advice for everyone, but it's not the only nugget of wisdom the season has to offer. I was pleasantly surprised to see the show directly call out the real source of Retzko and her co-workers' collective angst. Late-stage capitalism is such a pain. Obviously, with this being a series about a miserable salary woman suffering under malicious management at a big corporation run by an idiot, the failures of capitalism have been a major underlying theme in Agretzko from episode one. But this being a big corporate product designed to sell mascot merchandise, I never expected them to so much as imply that the reason everyone is miserable might be that the whole system is broken. Yet, here we have them stating it outright, and the person saying it is, without spoiling things, pretty much objectively the smartest guy in the class, and a close analog to a certain real-world billionaire who a lot of nerds tend to idolize. And while the show does posit that this character needs to adjust his utopian vision of the future to accommodate people who are happy leading lives of what he'd call drudgery, it also concedes that he's basically right and that the world he wants to build would be a good one. I don't think that the path to that world needs to be quite as sci-fi as the show makes it out to be, and this could just be a shameless attempt to co-opt progressive talking points for marketing purposes, but I think that any kind of remotely mainstream media just introducing its audience to the idea that capitalism might be outliving its usefulness is a net positive. And there's a lot of other positives to praise here, too. The returning characters are as lovable and complex as they've always been, the humor remains on point throughout, and Agretzko is still rocking one of the best dubs in recent memory. I'm giving this season a solid A, and I cannot wait to see what the show's next installment has in store for us. But Agretzko isn't Netflix's only stationary mascot-based anime about a young single working woman in a state of existential crisis. 
Man, I wonder what their demographics are like. Real Akuma and Kaoru is a rarity in the world of anime, a stop-motion series, and at first glance a rather charming one at that, though when is stop-motion animation not charming? The series follows a slightly sad, very single office lady named Kaoru who lives in a small apartment with three strange roommates. A big lazy teddy bear named Real Akuma, a smaller lazy teddy bear named Ko Real Akuma, and a bird named Kiroi Tori, who does most of the housework. This show is, in a word, quirky. It's got a soft, surreal sense of humor and a chill, slow pace to it that makes for solid relaxation fodder. At its heart, Real Akuma is a celebration of self-care in the face of loneliness and depression, of stopping to appreciate the small, happy moments in your life and make them for yourself. And in keeping with that theme, it exudes a serene, calming beauty. The craftsmanship apparent in its sets and character models is really something to behold, and while I personally prefer the slightly more exaggerated animation styles of Laika and Ardman, the subtle expressiveness of this show's characters is impressive in its own way. And I really wish there was more I could say about this series, but while I'm generally a sucker for stop motion and I appreciate what it's going for, something about it left me feeling a little cold. It doesn't really have the depth of character writing that's needed to make this kind of cozy slice of life work as anything more than a pleasant distraction, and it doesn't even work on that level for me all the way through, because the longer I watched it, the less I liked Kaoru as a character. When it started, I found her to be relatable, if a bit boring, but there's this one episode where she kicks her plushy mascot roommates out of the house because a psychic told her to, and while it gets resolved in the show and all is forgiven by the characters like, ha, sorry I made you homeless for a day, I brought you candy though, it was just such a shitty thing to do that seeing it go basically unacknowledged killed any empathy I had for her. And without that element of empathy, she kind of just ends up coming off as miserable. I still very much enjoyed watching the antics of Real Akuma and Co. They're super cute and often hilarious, but I got nothing out of those segments that I couldn't have gotten from watching Cheetan clips on Twitter. And a man cannot live on Kawaii alone, you know? Uh, that's not true, I totally can. This just isn't the Kawaii show for me. Still, I can appreciate the artistry behind it, and I recognize that not everyone's gonna be put off by Kaoru the way that I was, so I'm giving it a B. Next up is Netflix's newest original anime, Seven Seeds, which follows several disparate groups of humans who are unwittingly put into cryosleep before a meteor hits the Earth and revived centuries later to repopulate the planet, which is now overrun with giant insects and other hostile creatures. Also, none of those people have any idea what's going on, and the truth of the matter is kept a mystery to them and the audience in the first two episodes for... No good reason, really. Each group of survivors has a government guide with them who does know what's going on, but the woman assigned to the main group just lies and refuses to explain what's going on for days on end as the people in her charge verge closer and closer to going all Lord of the Flies on her ass because they haven't met up with the rest of their group yet and she doesn't want to explain it twice. I, I'm sure there's some sort of explanation as to why the government organization that froze all of these people wouldn't tell them what's happening or give them any kind of survival training whatsoever before entrusting the fate of humanity to them. Like, they, there'd have to be, right? Because it seems really dumb, but it's not offered in the first four episodes and I couldn't stand to watch any further than that. I just hate the characters in this show, all of them. The ones who are meant to be assholes are such comedically over-the-top dicks that I can't take them seriously, and the supposedly sympathetic characters are all just way too whiny, especially the protagonist. I'm not normally bothered by that kind of thing. I love Shinji's arc in Evangelion, and I will defend Sota from recreators to the death, but I cannot stand Natsu. I mean, there's social anxiety, and then there's being too chicken shit to call out to the only other survivors of what you think is a shipwreck across an empty field to tell them that you found water. I'm sure that there are real people out there with hangups that severe, and maybe this is a bit callous of me to say, but that kind of person wouldn't be my first choice, or my hundredth, if I was tasked with selecting a few dozen people from across Japan as humanity's last hope to repopulate the Earth. And they certainly wouldn't be my first choice for the protagonist of an anime that I want to watch to entertain myself. Then again, the same computer that made that call also had the government pay, canonically, a million dollars to freeze the kind of guy who'd threaten a woman with sexual assault at knife point the first time they're alone together. So, uh... I guess Natsu's not that bad in the grand scheme of things. Character gripes aside, the pacing of this show is 
absolutely abysmal. The story jumps around erratically across time and space with little rhyme or reason, rushing from plot point to plot point with few attempts to orient the viewer, and because it moves so quickly, nothing that happens feels like it matters. From what I've read, it looks like at least some of these frustrations are a product of bad adaptation. The manga's story follows just one group of survivors at the start, whereas the anime jumps back and forth between two in a very confusing manner, and manga Natsu is actually capable of shouting of her own volition instead of needing a man to do it for her, so that's something. Now obviously you've gotta cut some things and make some changes when you try to condense 83 chapters of manga into 12 episodes of anime, but uh, maybe then don't adapt it like that. Just a thought. It also looks awful. The animation is stiff and lifeless, the artwork is mediocre at the best of times and a poor representation of manga's soft shoujo style, and while the CGI is pretty good at some points, at others the compositing is just unacceptable. It's 2019, a shot of two people floating in water shouldn't look like disembodied heads in front of a Windows screensaver, yeah? Remember when Gonzo made stuff like Gankutsuo, Last Exile, Desert Punk, Bokurano, Welcome to the NHK? How does a studio go from that to this and conception? Ugh. The answer to that question is years of mismanagement just by the way. There are parts of this anime that I do really like. It's cool seeing the characters trying to navigate a Japan whose geography has been dramatically altered by rising tides and the passage of time, but when adaptation mandated time skips make things like distance and time feel negligible and those characters don't act like anything resembling real human beings, it makes it hard to actually buy into that cool setting, especially when it's rendered with such drab, uninspired visuals. Aside from Hero Mask, this might well be Netflix's worst original net animation to date. Everything about Seven Seeds that's not frustrating is boring, and for that reason, I'm giving it an F. To be clear, I only feel comfortable giving the show that grade without having finished it because I hated it enough to drop it. As far as I'm concerned, there is nothing Seven Seeds can do to make the time it's already wasted feel worthwhile or to make me not hate its characters, and I'm sure as shit not gonna give it any more of my time. There are a few other anime that came out on Netflix this year that I haven't seen enough of to make a judgment call on, though. Revisions is a fun, if fairly juvenile, mecha anime with a cool time travel hook, and it's one of the better looking CGI anime I've seen. Ingress the animation is a bit uglier, but it's a heck of a lot more engaging than I expected a mobile game adaptation to be, especially one of the thing that Niantic made before Pokemon Go. Lastly, Piano No Mori seems like a pretty fun shonen style look at classical music, but I haven't had time to give it a real shot. Hopefully I'll be able to look at all of those along with Carolyn Tuesday in a follow-up video down the line. Before we get to our final grade of the day, there's one more anime that I did watch all the way through but will not be grading. Ultraman from Production IG and Sola Digital Works. I really enjoyed it, but I feel like I don't have the context I need to properly evaluate what it's doing. Ultraman is a direct sequel to the classic 1960s tokusatsu series of the same name, which pays loving tribute to its legacy while also telling a story that I think critiques the unambiguous good versus evil plot lines of your average superhero story, as well as the xenophobia baked into Ultraman's fight the evil aliens premise. I say I think in part because the story of the first season cuts off before it can really answer the questions it's raised, and in greater part because I've never seen the classic Ultraman and without that context it's hard to get a full grasp of what this new series is trying to say and what it's accomplished. I don't know how much of its approach to the superhero narrative is a novel subversion and how how much it's taking from that original show, and I just don't currently have time to binge 40 episodes of vintage television to find that out. But again, despite my lack of context, I did really enjoy what Ultraman did both with its action scenes and its character writing, and I'm gonna keep watching it to see where it goes. Maybe once another season is out I'll be able to properly evaluate it. For now though, all I can say is that this was a fun time even though I haven't seen that original series, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how this studio combo and directing team handle Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. The last anime we will be grading today should have been an easy A for Netflix. Neon Genesis Evangelion is one of the greatest anime of all time, and the streaming platform won itself a 
ton of goodwill when it announced the long-awaited re-release of Hideaki Anno's seminal mecha series late last year. But most of that goodwill evaporated when the series was actually released. Netflix made a lot of changes to the show's localization beyond simply allowing Western fans to watch it in HD for the first time, and they were almost all for the worse. The most glaring change was the removal of the show's ending theme, a karaoke rendition of Bart Howard's classic Fly Me to the Moon performed by various singers and at times the voice actresses of Rei, Asuka, and Misato. The likely reason behind this change is pretty obvious. It's a pricey song to license in North America and it was probably cut to save a few bucks. Some will argue that this is a negligible trade-off for having access to Evangelion in any form and I can certainly see the reasoning behind that viewpoint. Aside from episode 15 where ripping the instrumental version of Fly Me to the Moon out of the backing track completely butchers one of the most emotionally resonant scenes in the series, it's not like changing the show's ending credit song changes its story or its meaning, right? Well, I'd argue that maybe in this show where most of the characters suffer from a pathological inability to communicate their feelings to one another, there might be some thematic relevance in ending every episode with a song about dancing around saying the words, I love you. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into this, and obviously I'm a bit biased as an anime credits aficionado, but if the creators of Evangelion didn't think that this song had significance as part of the message they were trying to send, why did they make a different version of that song for every episode of the show, plus a few more for the Laserdiscs and DVDs? Why did they bring it back a decade later for the first Rebuild movie? In my opinion, Fly Me to the Moon is a vital piece of the complete artistic package that is Neon Genesis. Evangelion, whether the pencil pushers at Netflix understand that or not. And from an art preservation standpoint, it is flat out unacceptable that the only version of the series legally available to Western audiences right now does not include it. And that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to problems with this release. While the new dub has a solid cast, the script suffers from hyper-literal line translations that no actor could deliver without sounding awkward. And the subtitles, if you can believe it, are even worse. To highlight just how bad they are, I do have to show you some scenes from late in the series. Nothing with super heavy spoilers, but there are some spoilers here, so watch at your own risk. The biggest point of controversy has been the new translation's handling of an implicitly romantic scene between Shinji and a new male Ava pilot named Kaworu. I'm saying I love you. I'm saying I like you. Now, translation is an art, not a science, and you can make a subjective case that the ambiguity of translating ski as like rather than love helps viewers connect with Shinji's feelings of confusion toward Kawaru, but only if you don't look at the broader impact this has on Shinji's characterization. Right after this scene, Shinji muses to himself that nobody's ever told him they love him before. Changing that to nobody's ever told me they like me reframes the profound pain of growing up without ever being told he's loved, not even by his parents, into something a lot more petty and juvenile, at least in English, where nobody says I like you outside of high school. This change robs this moment of its real weight and significance and obscures just how fucked up Shinji really is. Sorry, how the lowest of the low he is, because they changed that iconic line from End of Ava too. And Netflix's translators made another change to the movie that highlights just how little they really understand the show's characters. I want to stay with you, Asuka, and I want to help you, but I don't know what to do. Please, Asuka, you're the only person that can help me. Come on, I want to be useful. I want to be together forever. Gus, you're the only one for me! So let me get this straight. Kaworu, quite possibly the single most forward and emotionally open character with a speaking role in the entire series, expresses his affection for Shinji in a vague, non-committal manner, yet Shinji, whose whole thing is being quiet, vague, and indecisive, is able to make an explicit declaration of love to Asuka, even when he's clearly got some conflicting feelings toward her, that is completely ass backwards. No matter how you shake it, this is a bad translation that makes an already famously confusing series even more difficult to properly understand. To be clear, this release isn't unwatchable. It's definitely preferable to never watching Evangelion at all. This is still one of the greatest anime ever made and a phenomenal treatise on the human condition. But because of that, Ava deserves far better than the bare minimum. A decade-old, out 
out-of-print DVD collection should not still be the best legal way to watch this show in English. Evangelion as a series gets an A+, but this release of it gets a C. Not all of that is Netflix's fault, mind you. Studio Kara is reportedly very controlling with the Ava license and some of the translation issues with at least the dub, such as awkwardly calling Shinji the third children, are probably down to their meddling. But regardless of where all of these changes come from, they are a problem that needs to be noted and hopefully addressed. And while I don't know exactly what went on behind the scenes and who's responsible for what here, I don't think that anime-centric platforms like Crunchyroll, High Dive, and Funimation would have released Ava in a state this bad. Because whatever faults those sites might have, the people working there who I've met all really love and care about anime, and they would do everything they can to make Ava as good as it could be. Netflix seems to be eyeing anime in more or less the exact same way that TV stations did in the 90s, as a relatively cheap source of entertaining content that can be used to counter the unrivaled production capacity of their biggest competitors, particularly Disney. And just as those TV stations helped to introduce my generation to the wonders of anime, Netflix is contributing a great deal to the growth of the anime community today, which I am grateful for but they don't seem to respect that community or see the real value in the art that fuels it. That's the impression I'm getting from their delayed and mishandled releases, anyway. That said, they are getting anime out there and facilitating, in part, the production and distribution of some really great original series, so it's not all bad. It could just be a lot better. Those are my thoughts for now on the current state of anime on Netflix. I know I bang on about this a lot, but they're gonna be a major player in the Western anime community moving forward, and there's a lot I'd like to see them change to make the best use of that position. I'm sure you have thoughts of your own, so please leave those in the comments below, and while you're down there, my sleep-deprived brain could really use the dopamine spike of seeing my sub count go up, please and thank you. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.